Okay, it's doing good? Yeah. Doing good? Well, just a couple of announcements as we get started this morning. Uh, first of all, um, let me just mention we have Bible study tonight. Uh, you already got it. We're going to be completing that Bible study tonight. And then we're going to be off for two weeks. And then we're going to start up with a new uh, Bible study on Sunday nights called you, uh, excuse me, A Better Way to Pray. So now the date of that Bible study will start um, uh, Cinco de Mayo, May 5th. Uh, and that's in two weeks from now. So, but we do have Bible study tonight, and uh, and uh, then we'll go from there. Also, a couple of announcements: we do have our new website up, uh, LighthouseDiscipleship.org. That's LighthouseDiscipleship.org. We do have that website up. The live stream is not quite working on that website yet. Our goal is to get that up working soon. We still need to get a little bit more funds to get a new computer. To be able to, to facilitate that properly, uh, we have the funds for the new camera, but we don't have the funds for the new computer. So um, once we get that, that those resources, we'll be able to get it all synced to our uh, website. Um, and then we're going to be teaching on wisdom today as we continue our series. And then next week I'm going to take a break, and we're going to uh, do an Easter message for next Easter. So with that in mind, happy Palm Sunday, everybody. Okay, and so anyway, uh, we'll, uh, that's the direction we're going to go, uh, and after Easter we'll pick back up with the, uh, uh, hopefully very soon, concluding our, our Wisdom series. So we're all on the same page, we're all doing good? Doing good. Okay, so with that in mind, we'll continue with our, our message this morning on Wisdom, Wisdom being the principal thing, our main text for that, and cut down to other Proverbs. Where wisdom is the principal thing, and we need to pursue it. We need to go get wisdom. The last few weeks, we, as we conclude this uh, series, we've been talking about the pillars of wisdom. And in uh, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 1, oops, excuse me, I think I hit the wrong button. without that for right now. So, okay. So, I think I hit the wrong button, so I'm not going to confuse with all that right now. I will let mine. So, Proverbs chapter 9, nine verse 1 says, Wisdom has built her house, and she has hewn uh, out her seven pillars. And those seven pillars are uh, outlined in Proverbs chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. And last week we dealt with the two pillars, knowledge and understanding. Today we're going to take pretty much the whole time Doing with the third pillar, and that is judgment, and that's a that's a tough one, uh, because especially under uh, under the umbrella of grace and righteousness, it's hard for us to sometimes assimilate the, the idea of judgment. And we're gonna hopefully <coughs> not deal with that this morning, and then we still have four more uh, pillars that we're gonna deal with. Last week I mentioned how knowledge and understanding go together; they all seven go together. We need all seven pillars of the house. If you take away some of the pillars in the house, it can collapse. Okay? So you need all seven, and we have to learn how to work with them all in harmony. But knowledge and understanding work cl closer together. But in the same way that judgment, judgment also works with the next two that we'll be discussing when we after Easter, and that is justice and equity. And equity, we're not talking about the equity of your home. But we are talking about the, the house of God. We are talking about the, the, the pillars of the house of wisdom. So anyway, we're going to deal with judgment today. And again, the, this can be a confusing for the world and much of the church to assimilate. And hopefully, and it can be a, a, a tough one, and hopefully we can see how the scripture, and most of the scripture, I think almost all of the scripture I'm going to be using today, comes from Jesus and it comes from Paul. I'm going to be mentioning some things, possibly from James and Peter as well. But in other words, it's all New Testament. So we're going to be dealing with this from a New Testament perspective. That make, that make sense? Okay? So, but we need to understand judgment. We need to understand all seven pillars. And so that includes the, the pillar of judgment. Let me just say off the bat, we need good sound and I'm going to be using the term in a minute, righteous judgment. 
in our marriages. We need to use good judgment in our finances, in our careers, our vocations, our business, in any every quality of life. We need to use good judgment in parenting so we know what our kids should watch and not watch, what our kids should eat and not eat, who our kids should hang around with and not hang around with. We can't make all those decisions for them all the time, but we need good judgment in parenting. Let me just throw out some definitions before we get too much into this. The judgment, when we're talking about judgment, we're I don't want to use these definitions. It means to evaluate. It means to render a verdict, usually in a judicial setting. It means to render an opinion. It means it's a formal decree. It's discerning between good and bad, God and the devil. See, if we don't understand how to use good judgment... When we read scriptures, for example, submit to God and resist the devil, James 4, 7. If we don't know how to use good judgment, we won't know what to submit to. And we won't know what to resist. In submitting to, we're making a judgment. We're making a decision. We're determining something. I like this definition. It's the ability to render a matter correctly and declare it by God's word. To render a matter correctly and declare it by God's word. And uh, before we get into some other scriptures, uh, in a minute I'm going to deal with a few of them. But I want to begin to, in in these scriptures I'm going to be tackling about five or six different arguments or sayings people say in regards to judgment. I want to mention those, some of those. And then we're going to kind of tackle those arguments in the scriptures that we're going to be using in just a few moments. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay? But I want to throw out some of these, these, uh, these common sayings or remarks or, or judgments, <laughs> if you will, because they're, they're, they're rendering an, an opinion and people are decreeing something. For example, a lot of people say, especially in the church, but also in the world, we shouldn't judge. That is very common saying and declaration that people say that we shouldn't judge. First off the bat, just off the bat, by the fact of someone saying we shouldn't judge, they just did. Just by just I mean just off the back by saying we shouldn't judge, they just made a judgment that we shouldn't judge. So in, in one sense that argument almost cancels it out, but we want to look at this biblically. But let me just say this, I believe the devil wants us to believe that we shouldn't judge. Because if we don't judge, we will allow the philosophies of this world, we will allow the political correctness of this world, we will allow the natural media to render judgment for us in the way that we think. Um, because a lot of times this, this, uh, this idea of we shouldn't judge comes under political correctness. Now also we'll base this on scripture that Jesus says don't judge, which is another argument Jesus said don't judge. And we're going to look at scripture this morning. We're going to look at what Jesus said about judgment. And we're going to see that Jesus said the opposite. And we're going to look at that in just a moment. We'll answer that question. We'll deal with that in just a moment. I already said, you know, we need to, even as parents, we have to learn how to judge what our children should watch. We need to watch, we need to make a judgment what our our kids should should hang around with. I remember there was a time in sixth grade as I was entering into middle school, junior high, age. And there was a small season of time where I started hanging around the wrong crowd. And I finally, by an encouragement of my parents, some of our elders of our church and whatnot, I made the decision, I made the judgment to remove my friendship from this crowd. Actually, really only they, they actually more approached me than me approaching them to be friends, but in one guy in particular, the other guys were not I could see they were trouble, but uh, at the same point in time in my, that adolescence, I was looking for friendships. I was looking to be accepted. I was looking for uh, some buddies. That was always one big thing I always wanted. I always wanted friends. It's still a big desire of mine. But I made the decision, I made the judgment to dis- disengage my friendship with them. In doing so, they actually bullied me for the next two and a half years. 
But I also know by making that judgment as horrid as the bullying was for two and a half years, I want to look back at that even today, that if I had still been, befriended them, as horrid as the bullying was, my life might not be where it's at today if I didn't make that judgment. That makes sense? I made a judgment and it, it cost me being bullied for two and a half years. But if I, by making that judgment, it also, it also uh, protected me from going down a path I probably shouldn't have gone. Good. Kind of going with Star Wars, perhaps turning to the dark side, <laughs> if I can put it in those terms. I don't know what that protected me from. I'll never know in that sense. But it was a judgment call. Does that make sense? And when we're studying the pillar of wisdom, we need to learn, especially in this hour, in this day, to make good judgments in that regard. And there's different aspects of judging, okay? But everyone judges. And part of my heart of my message this morning, we need to learn to make righteous judgments. Good judgments, okay? Not only regarding circumstances and situations, but also people. And and, and dealing with that. If we don't understand or we don't become established in this pillar of wisdom, we will not judge. And we decide, I'm sorry, I was reading my notes. If we are not, let me say this again, if we're not established in this pillar of judgment, we will end up not judging, which is actually a judgment in itself. We have judged not to judge. That is a judgment. Sometimes by saying nothing is saying something. It's saying nothing. You have made a decision. You have chosen to keep your mouth shut. It is a judgment. It is a decision. It is an opinion. Okay? When you don't judge, you just chose to judge. I know that might boggle our minds, but it is a judgment. Here's another common saying that people will say. Who died and made you judge? Who died and made you judge? If you want the short answer, who died and made you judge? Jesus. Jesus died. And he, he redeemed us by his blood. And he has made us to be kings and priests to rule the earth. He, has, he said that whatever we loose in, on, on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever we bind on, on, on earth will be bound in heaven. There are aspects of the kingdom of God that we, as the children of God, as the people of God, as the church of God, that we have authority to judge. And it's right, in a righteous judgment. That term is going to come up more in just a moment. But in the answer to that, to that question, or that statement in the form of a question, who died and made you judge? Jesus did. Jesus is the chief judge, but he has made us judge. I'm going to get a little ahead of myself, but I felt like I need to mention it. I'm not talking about judging in a sense of condemnation. I'm not talking about judging in a sense of being critical. I'm talking about judging in a sense of making righteous judgment, and in some contexts, making a good decision. Does that make sense? We're going to deal with some other things as we, as we get into this. There's another saying. Jesus said not to judge. We're going to deal with that at large in just a minute. I've already mentioned that. Those people, some people will say, those people are very judgmental. I am also, let me just say this, I am not talking about being judgmental. I'm not talking about being critical and condemning. But I am talking about making righteous judgments and righteous decisions. Okay? There is a difference, and we're going to look at that. Okay? I mean, we've had people say... Just when we preach mercy and we preach goodness and we preach how the body of Christ should operate, we teach, we have had more people tell us that we're, who have been mean spirited to us. And they've called us to be mean spirited when we're trying to show mercy and grace. And yet they're being very mean and spirited about it. And so, anyway, uh, I don't want to deal so much with that one. But here's another big one that comes up, especially with our younger generation. Not just the younger generation, but it's coming up in our culture today. And this is another argument that, and they say, there are no absolutes. A lot, there's a lot of people who say, there's no absolutes. 
But then again, like just off the, off, the, off the cuff, by saying there's no absolutes, they just made an absolute. By saying there's no absolute. The very absolute about there's no absolutes. I know that's a tongue twister, but, it's, but let me just say this, and I will deal with that argument. There is truth. The Word of God is truth, and it's not subjective. In other words, there are some things that will always be right. They were right, they are right, they will always be right. There are some things that were wrong, they are wrong, and they will continue to be wrong. That makes sense? Okay? Uh, we're not under the law, but the law is still holy. We're still not going to have any God besides our God. We're still not going to lie, kill, steal, and, and murder, and kill, commit adultery. They, are, they were wrong, they are wrong, and they will continue to be wrong. We don't keep the law to become righteous, but we still obey the law. In that sense, we still honor our God, and we still honor one another. Okay? Um, there's some absolutes. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus did die. He did. He was buried. He did rise, rise, raise, raise again. He did rise from the dead. Sorry, I couldn't get that out. But that is an absolute. And sin is still dangerous. Sin is still wrong. Fornication is still wrong. Lying and gossip is still wrong. There's, there are absolutes. And we need to build our absolutes and our righteous judgment, as we get into in, in here in just a second, based on the Word of God. Based on the truth of God's Word. That makes sense? There are absolutes. Now let's get into, uh, let's share with me to John 7, 24. John 7, 24. Sorry about the screen this morning, but I just didn't want to deal with that. We'll be fine. You guys are good listeners, good followers. John 7, 24. A very popular teaching of Jesus on judgment. And Jesus said, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Jesus said, don't make judgment based on appearance, but make righteous judgments. In other words, don't be shallow in your judgments. Don't rush to judgments. Andrew Womack teaches this when he talks about leadership based on uh, the book of Timothy, Paul's letter to Timothy, but don't make speculative, don't have speculative imaginations. In other words, don't judge a book by its cover. We need to learn how to make good, excuse me, and righteous judgments. We need to judge justly. And we need to judge righteously and fairly. Some of this fairness that I'm kind of alluding to, we'll deal with more a little bit more when we get to the, the pillar of justice and the pillar of equity. We'll deal with that fairness a little bit more as we get into some of those. That's not why these, these pillars work together. Okay? But judgment is a pillar in the house of wisdom. And we need to learn how to judge correctly and to judge righteously. Not by appearance. Not by our feelings. Not with prejudice, but we need to learn how to judge righteously based on the Word of God. And we're going to see this in just a second. Let me allow the Word of God to bring some things out. But we need to learn out how and what to judge, because how we judge can be wrong. What we judge can be wrong. How we judge can be bad, and it can be wrong. Okay? But... If we're honest with ourselves, many people do what Jesus said not to do, and they don't do what he said to do. Many of us judge by appearance. We are, our culture is prone to judge by appearance. The church culture is prone to judge by appearance. I see it all the time. I see it on Facebook. I see it in conversations, I see it in the church, and I even see the temptations at, self, at times with my own life. We are not to judge by appearance, but we are to make 
righteous judgments, righteous answers. Okay? I believe we're not supposed to be prejudiced in judgment, especially in regards to racism. But let me just make a, st a statement real, real quick, just on even prejudice. Because the, the definition of prejudice is an unfavorable opinion or an unfavorable a feeling made beforehand or without knowledge by thought or reason. Prejudice is an unfavorable opinion or feeling made beforehand or without knowledge, thought, or reason. In other words, I know that i got to throw you in a loop for a moment. Some prejudice is not bad in this sense. I am prejudiced about who sleeps with my wife. I have made a decision beforehand. I have made a judgment. I have prejudged beforehand who is going to sleep with my wife. And I, there's no, there's no, there's no, if you have a problem with that, I can't help you. That makes sense? So there's some things that we are going to prejudge righteously. That makes sense? Prejudice. I know that throws us in a loop, but that I am prejudiced about some things. I am, you know, parents, you're going to be prejudiced about your kids on a certain level. That makes sense? And so uh, prejudice by itself, and that's not my message right now so much, but not all prejudice is wrong. You are going to make a righteous judgment about certain things. And we should. And at the same point in time, racism is wrong. Those who judge people by appearance is wrong. That makes sense? But we are going to make a righteous judgment. And uh, hopefully I'm making sense with that, but I was just trying to illustrate some things and bring some things up. Hopefully I'm making sense. But there are some things that we need to judge. And we need to judge righteously. And we need to judge, judge correctly. Not by appearance. That makes sense? Hopefully I'll draw this out a little bit more. Righteous judgment is rooted in God and His Word. Righteous judgment is rooted in God and His Word. Judgment is part of the image of God in you. It's part of the nature of God in you. God is judge, and church, are we not created in His image? Are we not created in His likeness? Judgment is part of the nature of God in you. Adam lost that, but Christ has restored that. Is God a merciful God? Is God a compassionate God? Is God a gracious God? And His grace is His his grace and His mercy and His compassion is His judgment on you because of Christ. Are you following me? God is merciful. God is compassionate. God is gracious. And that is the judgment of God. Everyone is judging. Either, either judging with the wisdom of man by appearance or they're judging by the wisdom of God. Which is pure, it's peaceable, it's gentle, it's without partiality, it's, it's willing to be entreated, it's full of mercy, it's without hypocrisy. And we are created in the image of God, in the likeness of God, and we will judge with a righteous judgment. See, if you are still an Adam, not being born again, or in your mind, you are not being transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you are not in Adam, you are in Christ. The second Adam. Satan is, if you are still in Adam, Satan is still blinding you of God's image in you. You are created, you are born again of the incorruptible seed of God by his word. And if you are still in Adam in your mind, then your judgments will get worse and worse. And your judgments will destroy your life. And ultimately they will destroy the culture. How do you destroy a culture? Little by little. One life at a time. Not knowing God's word. Not understanding God's word. And not making good judgments. 
If you don't know God's word, and you don't understand God's word, what we talked about last week, then you will allow the philosophies of this world, and you will let the traditions of man make the word of God of no effect. And you will make judgments in life based on the traditions of man and the philosophy and political correctness of this world. That is against God and will make the word of God of no effect. And by doing that, that is a judgment that you are making. See, God took us out of Adam and he placed us in Christ, restoring God's image in man, where we can make righteous judgments based on the nature of God and based on the Word of God. That makes sense? When we abide in Him and His Word abides in us, we make decisions, not just spiritual decisions, but decisions of our lives. And decisions who we're going to connect with. And decisions what we're going to do. Based on the nature of God. And based on the word of God. We're going to make decisions how we react. And how we respond to certain things. In our life. In our society. In our family. In our finances. In our body. Based on the nature of God. And the word of God. That is righteous judgment. Am I making sense so far? I'm barely getting into this. But let, let me look at another perspective. We are in the image of God, and we judge. Animals are not in the image of God, and they do not judge. I know cats can have an attitude. I know animals can have an attitude, but animals don't judge. They're not created to judge, okay? I'm not saying they don't make decisions of that nature or whatnot. God is judge when he created us in the image of likeness of God so that we can be Kings and priests to rule over there. I think one of the reasons why the devil wants us to believe that we evolved from an animal, a monkey, is to is a life in a pit of hell to remove all judgment from the culture. And I believe it's one of the reasons why the culture is where it is today. It's not the only reason. But we have learned, we have taught, we're not to judge. But we need to judge righteously. Okay? Um, see, man without God still judge. And their judgment is incorrect. It's false. It's based on feelings. It's what we've learned about in James. It's sensual. It's earthly. It's demonic. It's not wisdom that's from above. Most people judge by appearance. Most people judge according to the flesh. Most people judge based on their feelings. That's not what God, Jesus told us to do. He said, do not judge by appearance, but make righteous judgment. Okay? Let's switch gears a little bit. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. And I'm going to toggle to the Amplified. I want to read this out of the Amplified. In Matthew chapter 7, uh, beginning verse 1, and again I'm going to read from the Amplified Version, Matthew 7, 1, and it says, Jesus, this is Jesus talking, Jesus says, do not judge and criticize and condemn others. So that you may not be judged and criticized and condemned yourselves. You know, some people just read the first few ver- words and conclude what Jesus said. You know, do not judge and criticize and condemn others. I like how the Amplified brings that out. Because I, I like how the Amplified amplifies what kind of judgment he's talking about here. Don't criticize and judge people. That's what it says. So that you won't be criticized and judged. Does that make sense? Okay? See, in other words, I mean, here's, here's, I know I use our animals already. You know, we're not animals. We are created in God's image. But I don't know if you ever notice that in a zoo or in different places. But we're not monkeys picking fleas off one another. I'm not trying to be silly. But we're not monkeys picking fleas. We're not here to pick fleas off one another. 
We're not here to criticize and condemn one another. We're not animals. Let me say it this way. There is no place for criticism in the heart and, of, of, of a life, in the life of Christ. There's no place for criticism or condemnation in the heart of, of Christ or in the life of Christ. We are in Christ. I'm going to be teaching next week an Easter message about who we are in Christ. Being raised together with Him. But there's, there's no criticism, there's no condemnation in the nature of God. We're created in His image. There is a place to, for correction and there is a place for righteous judgment. We're going to deal with that in just a moment. But it has to be done with mercy. It has to be done with compassion. And, and, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But there is a place for righteous judgment. But don't judge people to be critical. Don't judge people to be condemning. That make sense? And I don't know if I'm emphasizing that enough. But that is one thing that Jesus said we are not to do. We are not to condemn and criticize one. Okay? Most people already know that, so I'm not emphasizing it enough. But I am saying yes to that. We are not to judge and condemn one another. Verse 2. For just as you judge and criticize and condemn others, you will be judged and can criticized and condemned in accordance with the measure you use, use to or deal out to others, it will be dealt out again to you. I need to read that again. Especially the last part. In the same measure, you deal it out to others. Deal what out? He's talking about judgment. In the same way that you judge others, it will be dealt out to again to you. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a natural and even spiritual law out there called you reap what you sow. God will not be mocked in the same way that you, you, you sow, you will reap. How you treat others, you will be treated. It's the natural law of the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But I want people when they judge me, not to criticize and condemn me, but I want people when they judge me, to judge me with mercy and grace and compassion. If I want people to ju judge me that way, I want, I'm going to judge them that way. I'm not responsible how they end up doing it, but I am responsible how I do it. Because I know sometimes we've been merciful as best we know how, and people have not always been merciful back. And here's another thing. I want people to hear me out. And so I'm going to hear them out. I'm not going to judge by appearance, but I am going to do righteous, just judgment. Okay? I'm not condemning them. I'm not criticizing them. But I am going to judge righteously. And we're going to look at this a little bit more. Let's go to verses 3 and 5. 3 to 5. Why do you stare from without at the very small particle that is in your brother's eye, but do, do not become aware of and consider the beam of timber that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me get that tiny particle out of your eye when there is the beam of timber in your own eye? You hypocrite. Verse, get the beam of timber out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the tiny particle out of your brother's eye. First, take the beam out of your eye, then you will be able to see to take the tiny particle out of your brother's eye. I don't know if you're getting those instructions there in verse 5. But unless we judge ourselves first and take the beam out of our own eye, we can't see the sake of the particle out of our own eye. He never said that there's not a place for me to help you take the particle out of your own eye. And I like how I said that, is that there's a place to help one another take the particle out. But we're not going to do that by judging and criticizing and condemning them. That makes sense? Sorry, just look at my notes here. I'm going to move forward from where I have. See, there are ways how we are to judge that are vital for us in the wisdom of God. 
of the kingdom of God. I want to list five things right here that I see in that both of these two texts that we just read. I want to list five things that we see in the pillar and the house of wisdom concerning judgment. The first thing is I see in these in these two passages of scripture that we read, we need to be careful and cautious how we judge. We need to be careful and we need to be cautious how we judge. The second thing is we don't don't rush to judgment. Don't rush to judgment. Third, don't be critical and condemning in your judgment. Don't be critical and condemning in your judgment. In other words, hear everything out before you make a judgment. Never just hear one side and make a judgment call. Okay? When we do what God, Jesus, God says to do, and refrain, I'm sorry, let me, I said that wrong. When we do what he says not to do, and we refrain from doing what he says to do, we hurt people. We hurt ourselves, and nobody wins. Nobody is edified. When we don't do, when we do what he says not to do, and we don't do what he says to do, we will hurt people, and we will hurt one another, we will hurt ourselves, and we will hurt God's reputation in the church and in the world. We are here to edify one another. That is a judgment. We choose. We make a decision. We make a declaration to edify one another in love and mercy and grace. Sometimes that includes taking a speck out of our eyes, one another's eye, but we have to first take this beam out of our own eye. That make sense? Which goes to points four and five. Number four, how we judge is how we will be judged. Now I'm not taking away from Christ has already judged us in Christ. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. But I'm talking about horizontal relationships. How we judge, we will be judged. It's called the law of sowing and reaping. We might not agree with it. We might not like it. But there's a law of sowing and reaping. God says, do not be marked. What you sow, you will be reaped. And my takeaway from that. How do you want others to judge you? I don't know about you, but I want people to judge me with mercy and compassion. And I want people to hear me out in certain situations. I'm not responsible how they judge, but I am responsible how I judge in that sense. I want to honor them. I want to honor the Lord. I want to honor God's word. I want to honor myself in that sense. That makes sense? I want, I, we will make a decision to judge with mercy and compassion. That doesn't mean we won't deal with things. And we'll, we'll, I'll get into some of that in just a minute, okay? Making sense? Here's number five. And probably the most important in one sense about all five is judge yourself first. Judge yourself first. I'm, but what I'm not saying with that, because it goes with you, it goes with judging yourself first because a lot of us do this too. I'm not talking about being critical and condemning about yourself. A lot of us do that. And I'm not talking about that. Have mercy and compassion towards yourself as well. But judge yourself first. In other words, why are you so bent out of shape and upset about the tiny particle in your brother's eye when you have a telephone bubble on your own? You know? I, uh, we have to grow up. And when we refuse to judge ourselves, this kind of goes with step five, when we refuse to judge ourselves, we disqualify ourselves from taking the particle of our brother's eye. If we won't judge ourselves first, we have just disqualified ourselves from being able to, first of all, it's just natural. You can't see to take the tiny particle when you got a beam in your eye. That's why the illustration. You can't even see it. It's not because you're not 
disqualified in one sense, even though it, that's true too, it, but we can't even see. You know? And so we, we, ha we can't see to do a, how can we make a judgment what's right or wrong when we're wrong? And I believe because we have not learned to judge ourselves first, a lot of us won't make a stand for what is right and wrong in our culture. Because we have learned and we have refrained from judging ourselves first, we won't make a stand, a righteous stand, for what is right and wrong in our culture in certain situations. We are unwilling to judge it first, ourselves first. But if we deal with ourselves first, we can righteously deal with others with compassion and mercy. Even situations in our culture. See, before I make any declaration what's wrong with you, I must be prepared to stand under that same judgment, that righteous judgment. See, Oftentimes in the church, and even in ourselves, we make others live to a standard we won't live to. So many times I've seen people myself, at times I've seen myself being followed with this, that we make others live to a standard that we won't live up to. And that is a hypocrite. And that is what the world at large has a legitimate beef over. Is that the world is correct when they call us hypocrites when we judge one way and live another. A lot of the world have a beef about that. And in that sense, they, have, they are right. They have a legitimate beef when we judge them with one way, but we live another. That's what the Pharisees were like. That's what a hypocrite is. That is hypocritical. Oh, we're making sense. Let's, uh, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 11. Hope we're making sense this morning. This can be a tough subject, but I'm trying to Bring in the word of God into this. First Corinthians 11, we're going to pick it up in verse 31. Now in context, I've taught from First Corinthians a lot in, in the past regarding communion, regarding the Lord's table. And that is the context right before where I'm going to pick it up in verse 31. The Lord's table is, I like calling it his table remembrance. When we remember that his body was broken for us, and his covenant, his blood was shed for us. And in this table of remembrance of us, we are to make, do we are to examine ourselves. And in that examination, we are making a judgment. We are the righteousness of God in him. We are judging ourselves through the, the, through the, 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 the finished work of Jesus. We're, we're judging ourselves as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We're judging ourselves through the judgment of Christ who became sin that we might be cut. Come, the righteous God. That is a judgment. And when we examine ourselves, we need to examine ourselves righteously. I need to do the same thing with my brother. I need to do the same thing with my sister. I need to examine themselves under the cross of Christ. That makes sense? Okay? But it's in that context that Paul makes this statement, beginning verse 31, and let me uh, get back to the New King James. It says, for if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened or disciplined by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. If we come under the judgment of the cross, through Jesus Christ being our propitiation, being our lamb, being our substitute, if we come in that, because he's talking about the table remembers, if we remember he was judged for us, so that we can be judged as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If we come under that judgment, we won't be judged with the world. I, in other words, the only thing that will keep you out of he heaven, I believe when we stand before God that day, he's not going to ask you, why did you do this? Why did you do that? He's going to ask you, what did you do with Jesus? And when Jesus is our propitiation, when Jesus is our lamb for us, he is our substitute for us, he's not going to see you in the flesh, he's going to see Jesus. And we're going to see this more next week, that we are in Christ Jesus. Okay? That is a judgment. And when that will be our judgment, we won't be condemned with the world. But at the same point, he says, we, if we would judge ourselves, 
we would not be judged. There is a place for judgment. It's called a righteous judgment. We are the righteous God in Christ Jesus. And based on that judgment, how we judge ourselves, we need to judge one another in the body of Christ. They are righteous. It says we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's plural. That makes sense? We are supposed to judge ourselves righteously. Here's another aspect of this too. You don't have to turn with me, but in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to the cause of all unrighteousness. It's healthy at times. God has already reconciled us to God through the cross, but how many of you know that sometimes when we get our feet dirty and we mess up, and we know we mess up, we need him to cleanse us, cleanse our mind and our conscience of all unrighteousness. It's healthy at times to say, I mess up, and I keep messing up, I need help. James says it this way in James 5, 16. Don't have to turn to it. Confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. There is a point and there is a place for you to come and say, I got some article, particles in my eye. I might even have some beans and some splinters, some two-by-fours in my eye. Will you come and help me? I need help. I don't want to keep toying with this. I don't want to keep struggling with this. Will you help me? There's a place for that. It's called love. It's called being the body of Christ. And it, it comes under this pillar of judgment. Many don't want to judge ourselves or have others judge us. See, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to read my nose here. But I don't know about you, but I want to, not only do I want to help myself at times, but I also want to help people who are struggling. I can't. Help them if they don't want help. I get that. We can't force ourselves on people. But but in order for me to help one another, I need to first judge myself. I need to get the beam on mine. So that I can be prepared and helpful and help other people take splinters out of their eyes. I don't want a beam in my eye, but I definitely don't want a particle in my eye. You ever have something in your eye? You can't do anything. You can't see until you get that fixed. It's a it's just a little tiny particle. But it's just bugging you crazy. You can't even open your eye. I want to help people. But i got to learn how to judge myself so that I can help people. And not judge by appearance, but to judge righteously. And to give counsel and advice and direction. That's judgment. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit here. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And this part gets a little hard. It's hard for the world at large, and it's hard for a lot of the church to assimilate this under the umbrella of grace and under the umbrella of we're supposed to love everybody. It's hard for people to see this as mercy. It's hard to see this as love. But the whole context of 1 Corinthians 5, or most of the context here, is there was a man in the church who was sleeping with his mother-in-law. His father's wife. It's called adultery. It's called incest. In this, in this case, it's wrong. And it's hard, again, I'm going to say, it's hard for much of the world to assimilate and turning someone over to Satan as Paul is encouraging them to do here in 1 Corinthians 5. Jesus talks about it in Matthew 18. Paul is dealing with it here in 1 Corinthians 5. There's actually another story too, I'm not going to go to it or teach on it today, but in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul does this with two other men, uh, Alexander and Himanius. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right. But a lot of that had to do with false doctrine and false teaching. But he did the same thing to them. And it was a different circumstances. It wasn't fornication in this case. But it was, there's a point to it. And especially when we're, the, the excuses will come out and, and it's hard for people to assimilate it. And I, I, I say excuses, but I, I don't want to be judgmental or critical on what I'm trying to say. But people are, we're under grace. 
We're supposed to love and forgive one another. Now, it wasn't so much that this guy messed up. If that was all it was, then we wouldn't even have this chapter. But the guy wasn't going to change. The guy was not repenting. The guy didn't think it was wrong. And can I just say this? There's some sins, if we don't deal with them, they will affect the whole church. If we don't deal with them, they will affect the culture. If we, the leadership, say it's okay, then we just gave permission to the rest of the church to do the same thing. And, it, and in this context, Paul will say, a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. A little yeast, a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. And there's some things we are dealing with it in mercy and grace because we want to protect you from going down this road and staying in this darkness where we also want to protect the church and say it's not okay because it will eventually affect the culture. And a lot of the fornication and stuff that's happening in our world today is because the church has done nothing about it to get to where it's at today. That, am I making sense? Hope we're making sense. And, and there's something that we have to learn how to deal with. And we see it as judgment and critical, but we're, it's mercy. If you're going down the wrong road, if, if the bridge is down, and you out of mercy and grace will say, stop, the way you're going is wrong, it's dangerous, it's going to ruin your life, it's going to ruin the church. Someone's got to get up and say, no, we can't do this. We can't act this way. We can't be this way. That is judgment, but that is righteous judgment. It is mercy. It is compassion. It is hatred to know the bridge is down and let your brother just go ahead and drive off the cliff. Now, if they want to bypass your warning and drive off the cliff, that's not on you. That's on them. But there is a point in place that it is wrong, and what you're doing is dangerous. And I'm not going to associate. I'm not going to glorify it. Paul says in this context that by not doing anything, you are actually glorifying their sin. That's wrong. This relationship may be reconciled, but in this case, he didn't say it was wrong. And I'm not saying he, he still, Paul is treating him as a brother. He's still in Christ. But his behavior, because he's unrepentive and being defiant about it, in a sense, it's affecting the, it can affect the church. Paul's not even there. But if you look at verse 3, I'm not going to read the whole context. Verse 3 says, For I, Paul, indeed as absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has done this deed. That's Paul. Paul says, I have already judged. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Not his spirit, but the destruction of his flesh. That his spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 6, your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lot? I don't want to spend too much time with this. But I just want to, want to say, there are some things that we need to deal with. And a lot of the church has stayed away from this. A lot of pastors stay away from this. Because I understand it can bring a mass confusion. Many don't understand. They think that we're excommunicating people from the church. They think that we're punishing people in the church. There's a difference between punishment and discipline. And there's a difference between dealing with something. Especially when someone is unrepentant. Paul judged in this sense. He invoked church discipline. As it's spelled out in Matthew 18. I taught on this about a year and a half ago. The boy was sleeping with his father's wife. Paul was not angry at the man. He was not mad at the man. Paul loved him. Paul was 
If we think it's okay, we will continue to do it. But he wanted to destroy his flesh so that hopefully he would stop destroying his life. How many of you know this type of lifestyle may not ruin this, this relationship is not going to be close. He might be saved, but you cannot have an intimate relationship with God when you're living in sin. But more, even more, it's going to destroy his family. It's going to destroy his life. It's going to destroy his reputation. And if we allow it, we're going to corrupt the whole culture. That makes sense? We don't sometimes see that. We think that you're being mean to him. No, I'm trying to save him. But my bunch of darkness. And people don't see that. And, and we need to see that. We're, we got to do it in love. We got to do it the right way. We're not, we're, we're not rushing to judgment. We're not judging our appearance. But we're using righteous judgment. And there's a place and a time and there's a way to do it. And Matthew 18 spells out how to do that. It sounds horrible. But we, because we don't know. We haven't been taught. How to love people and cover people properly at times. See, in John 20, 23, <coughs> Jesus talks about whatever sins we remit will be remitted and whoever sins we retain will be retained. And I, again, that's hard for a lot of us to simply understand. Jesus is not teaching. I'm not teaching. <coughs> <coughs> Paul's not teaching, we don't have the power to forgive anyone's sins. Only Christ does. But how many of you know that when you are sinning, and especially when you're living in unrepentant sin, you have just opened a door for the enemy? And Jesus is saying in John 20, 23, we can, re we can put people's sins into remission, just like cancer. You can put it into remission. The, the effects of that sin. While we're trying to work it out, while we're trying to get the bottom, while we're, while we're talking this through, we can put the effects of that sin into remission. That can, the, your pastor, the church can do that. Protect you from the evil one while you were working this out and trying to get this under control. Not by the flesh, but by the Spirit of God. Walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. But sometimes when we're struggling with something, we need help. But we can put sins into remission. I know it's hard for us to understand that because we haven't learned how to do that properly. We talk about people. We gossip. We don't pray for one another. We, and with, it's, it's, I don't have time to get into all this. But you know what happens when we retain? We just pull the covering. We've been covering them, helping them, praying for them, keeping the enemy at bay while we're working this through. But when they say, I don't want your help, I don't want to change, oh, we, we don't even have to do anything. They removed the cover. They just jumped off the cliff. They just plunged themselves into darkness. And, and a lot of times we don't even have to do anything because most of the time they just leave the church. And they just, they just go into, they retain themselves. They done it themselves. I want to help you without mercy. I'm not going to glorify your sin. I'm not going to glorify your problems, but I want to help you. But if you don't want my help, we've done this with people. We've done Matthew 18, and we get to the last step, and they say, I don't want your help. I want nothing to do with this. What I'm doing is okay. We just remove the cover. And it sounds horrible. We didn't do what they did. But we're here, and we've had people. We've done that with and then we get the call, or we get the text. Then sure, I was wrong. Will you help me? Will you forgive me? We've done that. We have one particular person not too long ago did that. Would you ever forgive me? And we said, absolutely. We forgive you as if you've never done it. We don't hold it against you. We embrace you. That's everything I've described in church. That's called judgment. And it's called righteous judgment. Because the purpose of all that discipline was to get them to this place. Where they're free from sin. They might be right with God. But now they're free. And that is awesome. That is pow powerful. That is salvation. If you are doing anything that will harm you, I want to help you if you let me. That's called judgment. 
That is a pillar of judgment. I don't know about you, but if I'm hurting and I don't know how to help myself, I'm going to go to my brother. I'm going to go to a pastor. I'm going to go. I need help. I need to listen. I need to come under their teaching and their counsel and their wisdom. That's called judgment. That's good. That's healthy. We're not criticizing. We're not condemning. We're not ostracizing. We're not giving up on people. We're not quitting on people. We're loving them. But we're also not doing we're tolerating and condoning the sin and the behavior. We are going to say it's wrong. We are going to say it's not right. We are going to condemn the behavior and not the person. That's judgment. That's righteous judgment. Amen? See, many, can't, many people can't reconcile these things in the grace and love and mercy of God. But when you understand mercy, Proverbs 3 talks about mercy, and it goes on. He says, don't bind it around your neck. Put it on the, right on the tablets of your heart. Don't let it go. Don't be, don't, lean not on your understanding. In all your ways, and knowledge him. Don't be wise in your own eyes. And then he starts talking about discipline. And he starts talking about the, the fruit of righteousness. And, and, and the writer of Hebrews echoes when he wrote about in Proverbs chapter 3 about discipline, the Lord loves, chases the ones he loves. He showed me a room for people who have people, kids. I can show you the ones that are loved, the ones that have learned discipline, the ones that have been spanked at times because they're being loved. But the ones who are not being spanked, they're not loved. That's called hatred. I'm not talking about abuse. I'm talking about discipline. I'm, any good coach is going to discipline his athlete. Any good mentor is going to discipline his student and his, 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 his disciple, his pupil. Any, any good parent is going to disciple, uh, discipline their kids. Any good pastor is going to discipline their church. Any good leader is going to discipline their followers. Not to destroy them, but to help them. It's called grace. It's called love. It's called mercy. And the fruit of righteousness. The, Proverbs 11, I think, 11.30 says, is the tree of life. But in this context, I got to, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 12, Paul makes this statement at the end of all that. He says, For what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. And one man, I don't, I don't have time to spend a lot of time with this, we're almost out of time. But Paul is saying, we are to judge one another within the church. And we're going to see this in a few more moments. I'm going to read more and more scripture before we get ready to close. God will judge those outside the church. But we are to judge those in the church. We are to invoke church discipline. Or it will affect the church. We need to put away the evil person. The whole goal of that is not to ostracize. The whole goal of that is to break their flesh so they can turn around and come back into fellowship. Does that make sense? It says in Galatians, when if someone uh, uh, sends among you, those who are spiritual are to restore such one. When you, you start, say that word restore, it's the same terminology as mending. If I were to break my arm, I don't cut it off. But I'm going to put it in a cast. I'm going to restrict activity. I'm not going to, the goal is to restore back into no, normal uh, function again. But there's going to be restricted activity. But if it, it, it becomes infected, if it becomes, and it's going to take my life because there's gang green in there, it's affected, and it's going to destroy my life, the best thing you can do from destroying the whole body is to cut it out. And then you need a miracle. For God to give you a new one. That makes sense? But we have to take the infection out. We are, in other words, Paul is also teaching here, and he's teaching throughout this, that we ought to judge within the church. See, most pastors are scared to death to even teach on this. But I, as a pastor, love people too much to not tell them the truth. And I am willing to pay whatever price, even your rejection. To tell you the truth in love. 
if it will be received. And I'm, I understand there's boundaries with that. I understand, there, you know, I'm not everyone's pastor. I get that. I'm not talking about that. And I'm not talking about the world. I'm a pastor of this church. And I'm pastor here. I'm pastor of those who God has brought into our lives. Okay? Um, sorry, I'm trying to skim through my notes. I only have a few minutes left. Let's go to first, uh, let's go to chapter 6. Now, can I get a witness? Chapter 6 comes after chapter 5. I know that's not really theological here, but chapter 6 comes right after chapter 5. So he's still talking in the same context. And he starts with verse 1 says, Dare any of you have a matter against another? Go to the law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that saints will judge the world and the world will be judged by you? Are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? I mean, just, I'm going to read a little bit more, but he says, First of all, he says, why are you taking your matters, that you, why are you not resolving your matters? Why are you taking them to a court? Why are you taking them to an unrighteous judge and not dealing with them upon the church? In other words, he, I'm also hearing too, Paul saying, we need to resolve our conflicts. We need to resolve our problems, and we need to do that in the church, not air our dirty laundry to the world. Let me read some more. I want to read verse 2 again. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? We will judge the world. I don't understand all of that yet. I don't get all of that yet. But Paul said we will judge the world and the world will be judged by you. Are you, not, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters within the church? If we're going to judge the world, why, why can't we judge the matters of the church? Verse 3. Do you not know that you shall judge angels? I don't understand how that works. How much more the things that pertain to this life? If you did not have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? <coughs> I say this to your shame. This is Paul talking. I say this to your shame. Is it so... That there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren. In other words, I mean, one thing I see Paul saying, the least spiritual person in you, if they are in Christ, if they are born again, they are more worthy to judge in the church than the world. I don't know if you see that. But someone who is in Christ, someone who is born again, the least of you, and uh, uh, the least esteemed by the church, is able to judge more than anyone outside the church. There, there's a teaching here, too, that we need to deal with things among the church. We don't let the world settle our matters. We let the church resolve our matters. <coughs> I don't understand all of that. I'll be honest with you about that. But... I'm also saying, too, we're not resolving our conflicts. And I've seen this in the church, and I've also seen how this has affected society today. Look how far we have come in the church. No wonder our culture is unraveling. It's not the world's fault, it's the church's fault. Peter says, I don't have time to turn to it. Actually, let's turn there as we, as we close. Let's, um, excuse me, let me give you the reference. First Peter 4, 6, 17. <coughs> First Peter 4, 17. For the time has come for judgment to begin where? At the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now the righteous one is scarcely saved. Where will the ungodly and the sinners appear? Therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him and doing good as to a faithful creator. There's a lot in there I don't need to go into. But judgment starts in the house of God. It goes back to the five points I mentioned earlier. That we need to be careful and cautious how we judge. We don't rush to judgment. We're not critical of condemning our judgment. How we judge, we will be judged. 
and probably one of the most important ones I get out here is that we need to judge ourselves first. There's a lot here. I, don't, I wish I had time to go into this faster, uh, more deep, more detail. But we need to learn how to judge righteously. And even though we should resolve matters within the church, we should be able to... Those of us who have understood the grace and message of, of His of great mercy... I, let me just, can I just say this? Has God, through Jesus Christ not forgiven us a horrendous debt. Every single person here listening to this message deserves hell. But by God's grace and His mercy we have received eternal life through Jesus Christ. Who of us is unworthy to reconcile and resolve conflicts with the body of Christ and with one another. What have they done that we can't work it out and resolve? I'm not saying we're all going to be best friends. I'm not talking about that. But we need to resolve matters in the church. We need to resolve differences. And Paul is upset that the church isn't in Corinth. In Corinth? Corinth was a wild church. They had a lot of issues. But Paul, the apostle, was dealing with those issues. He didn't just put the church up, well, they're, they're Corinthians, of course. No, he dealt with them. He wanted them to become mature in the relationship with God. He loved them. It was not okay. <clears throat> and he dealt with them. Righteously, he loved them. And actually, if you read about this man in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul told him, encouraged him to restore the man back into fellowship because he was repentant. That is salvation. That is wisdom. That is why we do it. And Corinthians grew, continues to grow to be a great church, a beautiful church. But there's some things that we have to clean up. Not to receive His grace. So much. But we need to clean up so we can, you know, if you are living in sin, you are going to limit like how God is going to use your life and be effective. It will be a snare. It, it, and it can still destroy your reputation with man and your effectiveness. It will, it can set, sin is still deadly and it will destroy your life. Grace is not a license of sin. Grace will teach us. Grace will discipline us to deny ungodliness. Those who are not willing to deal with issues don't understand grace. Because grace will teach us to deny ungodliness. And we need to deal with things. Discipline is all about your future. Punishment is all about your past. We're not dealing with the past. We're dealing with your future. That makes sense? And we need... And Paul's saying, if, if there's anywhere where we should be doing this, we should be doing this in the church. Jesus is saying the same thing. Peter's saying the same thing. We need to judge them on ourselves. Righteously. Not by appearance. Not in the flesh. Not wrong. Not with criticism. Not with condemnation. But judgment is the pillar of God's house. It's the house of wisdom. It's wise. And you show me men, men and women who have been disciplined well. Who have matured. They don't live like an animal like they once lived. They don't live like they used to. And we're going to talk about it next week. One of the things I'll bring up. Our desires change. When we become born again. And different things. And sometimes we need some coaching along the way. We need some discipline right away. To reprogram our mind. The whole purpose is to break the flesh. And walk in the spirit. And when we condone people's behavior that's wrong, we are doing them injustice. We are harming them. And there's a right and there is a wrong way to do it. We're not criticizing. We're not condemning. We're not beating them up. We're not nagging them. But we are judging righteously. If they won't let us. If they won't let us, then we have to let them be. And they are actually tormenting themselves. That makes sense? We can't force them on people. But at the same point, 
at any point in time, there are certain things we're not going to allow. Andrew Walnut has kicked people out of cares for fornication and stuff. He kicked them out. He's not going to allow that to happen in this church. And he's not going to let them be leaders with their license, uh, uh, license to preach. Living that way. It's not gonna allow, he's not going to allow it. He's going to show them grace. He's going to show them mercy. He's going to pray for them. He's going to work with them. But there's going to be some discipline. And it's, right, it's the right way to do it. Does that make sense? doesn't mean they can't come back at some point. But not until there's change. And not until there's repentance. And so, does that make sense? Hopefully, I know it's getting that hard. This, it's hard to teach judgment without teaching justice and equity, too. All seven pillars work together. Next week, I'm going to do an Easter message, so it's going to be a couple weeks before we get back into this. But we're going to come back and we'll touch justice and ju equity, and hopefully you'll see how these three work together. Okay, so don't just base everything on just judgment. It, we have all seven pillars that build this house. Okay, we need all seven to work in harmony. We need knowledge. We need understanding. We need judgment. We need, we'll see, I see next, next time we get together with this, well, we'll see, we'll need justice. And equity, fairness, prudence. We need, uh, we'll also see that we need discretion and we need subtlety. That'll be another hard one to, to, to talk about because we all understand the word subtlety in a, in a positive sense. So I'm going to bring that out. So, Lord, we worship you, we exalt you, we magnify you, we thank you for your word. Lord, we want to judge righteously. We want to be good. We want to be pleasing in your sight. We want to be a blessing. Lord, we thank you. We worship you. We magnify you.